appreciate it. So welcome everyone. This is the lightning talks for Open Imperio 2020. This is an exciting uh, piece of our agenda in which we force people to be to talk very quickly and say something dramatic and and wonderful um, in just a few a few minutes. Um, I'm Martin Ramsey. I'm the uh, managing director of the Lamp Consortium, and I'll be your moderator. And I have, if we were in person, I would have a big shepherd's crook. And when Jacques is run out of time, I will grab him back and throw him off stage, and the next person can start. I'm only kidding, Jacques. That's not what we'll do at all. Um, but I want to. We we have uh, four presentations, and so we have a little bit longer than the five minutes that were originally promised. Um, and so people can take a little bit longer, but I'm going to turn it over to Jacques Renault, who is in Montreal. And uh, here I go, trying to pronounce the name correctly, Eric Dacnoy. No, I didn't get it right. Who is in France. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to let you guys take it. You can grab the screen and, and tell us what you want to talk about. Uh, curricular transformation in a French university, a short Karuda visual story. Okay, Eric, I lost the share screen. Where is it now? I had it before. Uh, I, I, am I a presenter or? You, you don't really, you just have to begin, begin sharing the screen. Um, and it's at the bottom of your screen probably, although it depends on where, you know, this. Yeah, this it's kind be. of strange because I, I, you had I was it a minute ago. I had a minute ago and I don't see it anymore. And it was, and it's because I grabbed it. I'm sorry, I, you had it, I know you had it. Um, this Chuck, I've it? got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, hover your mouse at the top of the screen, Jacques, and see if that will open it up. I'm I'm seeing it on my screen, but I can't see what's on your screen. No, I know it's. Uh, I, maybe if I start the video, no. Uh, you don't see anything from from me, do you? No, not yet. We saw your video for a second there. It should be in the middle of the screen on the bottom. Yeah, that's that's yeah, where it is on mine. If you hover over the bottom part of the Zoom area. Okay. Yeah, but, uh, okay, I'm sorry about that. Okay, now I got it. Okay, good. Uh, I'm so. You're uh, fine, okay. Jack. You're no, among friends. Good. There we go. We see Everyone it. Everyone sees that? It. Yep, we see it. Okay. From theory to practice, a short visual story of Karuta OSP supporting the implementation of a curricular transformation in the University of France. My name is Jacques Reynaud from ePortfolio, and I'm uh, helped by my colleague Eric Duquenois from Université Littorale Côte uh, d'Opa. So it is going to be a short Karuta OSP story. A long, long time ago, in May 2019, the French Minister of Education is on stage to announce a very ambitious change to university programs. Uh, we are going to launch a new program based on uh, competencies. Wow, this is a very ambitious objective. <laughs> Uh, we need a nice web environment, uh, simple, uh, cheap, easy to use, flexible, not expensive, and um, uh, open course, uh, open source, uh, of course. Which tool? Wow! Uh, being involved in numerous, uh, Karuta team is ready to help with an open source tool available since 2014, and uh, it, it helped many French universities. Um, looks interesting. Uh, we need the pilot. The French uh, ministry continue. We have an university in the south of France that is looking for a portfolio pilot. You should contact them. Perfect. Oops, I read. <laughs> I made a mistake. <laughs> Go on, Eric. Do it. It's better for you. And the University of the Source of uh, uh, France is looking for a hip hop for your pilot. You should contact. Perfect. <laughs> uh, the Zoom discussion the... between Karuta and University pilot team. They had a very detailed and nice looking plan on paper. How to move that online. 
we need a collaborative tool to build the competencies repository. Uh, a team leader will use the tool to fill a template. Uh, well, see the nice chart below uh, for our plant. Wow, interesting. Yes, uh, I see. Well, for, for people around most programs uh, in this uh, framework will have at most uh, six competencies or skills with very detailed descriptions over there. And this is uh, the requirements are here nicely presented. This is a PDF from the school, the university. First, there will be competencies with a, a very detailed description. And then there will be level of development of this uh, competence or skill. Finally, uh, associated to these level of development will be critical learning activities, uh, things that our students will do. And th these will be linked to different courses. The template will be the same for all program. Another Zoom discussion between Caruta and the university team. When do you need this tool? Uh, next month. <laughs> that would be great. Next month? <laughs> uh, the the Karutu team immediately gets to work. Fortunately, Karuta is a very flexible and iterative. You can add sections, uh, parts, you can add different resources, you can set roles for different users, and you can add all sorts of menu. The prototype was ready in one month. Uh, this is a typical competence page, which all the edit, delete, move button, and whatever that they were sort of uh, looking for. The Karuta team delivered the first version of the tool. The meeting went well, but the university team asked for something else. Great, but our instructors would like a nice printout like the one you sh we showed you before. Is it possible? Is it really important? Okay, we'll work on it. And uh, this is the printout of uh, finally the, the content of the portfolio. It's almost identical to the PDF version presented initially by the university. The university team asked for some additional change. Great, this is perfect. But uh, we have another request. Uh, we have to link competences to first professional situations. And uh, secondly, the RNCP skills. It's a request of the ministry. Are you sure? <laughs> yes. Okay, <laughs> we'll work on it. And uh, RNCP uh, in France, it's a directory or repertory of all trades and profession in France uh, with associated skills. It's come directly from the, uh, the government. So uh, we sort of uh, expanded the model and there is now a way to associate a professional situation to all competences. You see with the, the, the arrow there. And uh, there was a way to link uh, the learning activities to one or numerous RNCP skills. This is the final printout of uh, with professional situation uh, and uh, the RNCP blocks uh, that you can see. A final Zoom discussion between Karuta and the university pilot team. Great, we will try it. Uh, thanks for the speed. And it's also Chibulit ready, great. No problem. Let us know about the pilot. We're really interested. And then the pandemic arrive and the French universities close March 14. So we'll see for the follow-up next year. The moral of this story, e-portfolios are not simple. Many iterations are needed. Better have a flexible tool like Kauta or OSP or open source portfolio. Just a, a small paid advertisement, it's not part of the uh, 
of the presentation, but for those of you who want to uh, learn more about the uh, Caruta pandemic portfolio, uh, there is a session at 11.30 about uh, Caruta uh, will be presented and or you can create an account. I will put that on the uh, on the chat. Uh, you can go at theportfolio.com Caruta 3.0a and you just create an account and that will be available. So thank you. Thanks. Eric. Very good. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Jacques. That's Thank that's quite wonderful. <laughs> and and extra credit for the creativity. Well done. <laughs> Any questions for, for Jacques and Eric before we let them go and move on to Josh? Hopefully, Jacques, you saw the, the nice chat messages. People really enjoyed that. I'm sorry. No, I was really concentrated. I made a mistake. Sorry, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> You, you did a good job. It was, it was marvelous. Oh, and there's the timer. Okay. So next up, if you'll stop sharing your screen, um, we'll let yes. Josh, uh, uh, Josh grab it. And so Josh Wilson, who virtually needs no introduction from Longsight, uh, will be talking about can faculty stomach mid-semester changes in Sakai? Hmm. Take it away, jo uh, Jacques. <laughs> Josh. <laughs> oh, man. Here we go. Well, Thanks. Um, so I'm actually not here. I'm doing an anti-lightning talk. I'm not here to share information. I'm actually here to get information. I have, from the, the I have a conference presentation in five minutes. I don't know how this is going to go. Okay, I'm going to mute somebody I'm there. Five minutes when I leave, you better get the Xbox out of that room. No, they can wait for five minutes. No, uh -oh. is it only for everyone? Sorry, I'm going to. I don't know that I have the ability to mute everyone. No, I think uh, Kathy has to do that. Yep. All right. Um, well, I will. My my office mate is under the. Bed, so you know, <laughs> quiet. Um, all right. So, so I want to uh, pose a question to you guys and get some information back. Uh, we've had a discussion in Sakai circles lately, you know, where we have said, "Huh, we wonder about this." And so, I want to pose it to all of you, smart people. And uh, I've got a quick two-question poll for you in a minute or two, and uh, and we will take a look and uh, and, and see what you think. All right, so here we go. Can faculty stomach change? Here is the question. So the, uh, the LMS has tended to be in the, in the center of this debate. So there is a thought among Sakai developers that uh, you know, perhaps uh, what we don't want to do is to add capabilities in midstream. So perhaps faculty really don't want anything to change in mid-semester, even if it comes at the expense of getting uh, newer capabilities for teaching. So on the one hand, we've got the driver for no change in mid-semester, keep it the same all semester long. And on the other side, we've got the driver for uh, adding new features frequently so that faculty can have access to new capabilities. And so the thing to think about is here, what do faculty want? What are, um, what do your, what is your, what are your faculty's views on this particular issue? So this is uh, in some ways stage one of this question. So we want to get your thoughts about this. And uh, we also will eventually want to ask this question of faculty members as well. So, so here we go. Um, so I'm curious what you guys think. So I have a very quick two question Google poll, a Google form that I'm going to put the link to in the chat. So I would love it if you would go and answer these two questions, you know, one of which is about uh, faculty views on this issue and another one is asking for your random other thoughts on this issue. So Josh, we got an issue. We got a permission issue on the Google form. We have a permission issue. I thought I changed it. Let me check. Um, oh, yeah, that is that is a bummer. Right, hold on one second. Um, I am unrestricting the form. I'm changing the permissions. All right, the permissions have been changed. Thank you, thank you, Christina and Harold. Um, all right, so quick two question poll and uh, I would love to get your responses and I can, I can report back either now or later. All right, here we go two responses. All right, I'm going to switch the screen share here. And I will just show this live. Uh, 
extra points, Josh, for doing it live. I know, seriously. I, I, I like to fly without a net. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> So, and just as a reminder, so uh, a low, so it's, it's a four point scale where one is no feature change in mid semester and four is frequent release of new features. And these are what faculty value. And just for the record, there are 60 people online. So um, you're, you're getting some, this is some serious feedback. Yes, yeah, so we've got uh, 24 out of 60. So we're nearly halfway there. Keep going guys, keep going. I'm not giving back the screen share until you all answer. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, I was thinking, I'll, I'll give you the backdrop to this while you guys are all answering, uh, which is that we've been discussing uh, the question in the Sakai community about whether to move from a major release model where we release features once a year and maintenance releases throughout the year uh, and moving to a continuous release model that's more like Google. Uh, or, you know, or Slack or others where, uh, you know, with, with knowledge and information sharing, features are, are released over the course of the year. So the argument that many have made is we couldn't possibly do that because faculty wouldn't ever stand for it. Uh, and others have said, well, they stand for it with Google, they stand for it with Slack, they stand for it with Office 365. Why should Sakai be any different? Why should we make people wait a year to get the new stuff? So that's what's behind this question. Um, I now have 39 responses pushing 40. What's interesting is that still the majority of the responses fall on the no change side. You know, so 26 of 40 responses, now 27 are on the, the less change side and only 11 are on the more change side, which is fascinating to me. We've got a couple of other thoughts here as well that people are sharing. Uh, fear of things breaking. Uh, there's a second person said they don't like things to break. Uh, you know, how do you deal with the individual that wants that one feature now? It depends. Uh, people are far more accepting of change. Fix bugs. Um, yeah, no features, fix bugs. Okay. Some institutions don't permit this. Um, I mean, I think it'd be important to note that, uh, you know, from a Sakai perspective, the new features would be available and institutions would be able to choose to adopt them. That would be an institutional choice. I don't know if that changes what you would say to all of this. Um, all right. So I guess with 41 responses, uh, you know, I would love more, but I'm starting to, the, the picture is starting to, uh, is starting to flesh out here. Although I do notice that those who answer three, which is slightly on the side of more change, uh, that number is growing as we get more responses. It was like the early responders were all, you know, very focused on, uh, you know, the outlier one response and we're, we're filling out the middle right now as we go. Anyway. So uh, Josh, yes. there's a good comment from Louisa. Um, are the no change side tech people or are they faculty people? You know, are they academicians? Uh, we don't know, I bet, but uh, it would be interesting to know whether that skewed academics versus non-academics. Uh, yeah, yeah, very true. And, you know, Laura Sierra notes, maybe the faculty would accept change, but the leadership is risk averse. Yeah. So that, right. That's kind of an interesting thing as well. So, I can, uh, we can do one of two things. We can hang on here for a minute or so and, and uh, look at a few more thoughts. Uh, you got two minutes. I've got two minutes? Wow, all right, well, I'm not- I'm being generous the because there's only four presentations. <laughs> I'm not releasing the microphone until I get my full five minutes then. <laughs> all right, what are, what are some of the other comments? Uh, we have another one about uh, leadership being risk averse. They won't even notice, someone says. Uh, another push for fixing bugs. Another another person says it depends. Um, another person says it it it, it depends depend it, you know on the tool here. And as 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 we notice uh, as we're looking at the responses, three, which is slightly change accepting, is now at twelve. So it's very nearly the same as one and two. So we we still have the idea that uh, you know sixteen are on the side of change and twenty eight are on the side of no change, uh, but the, uh, but the middle is starting to win out. Institutional culture, um, there's chaos in the middle if you change stuff. UI changes might be harder, but new features might be like money on the ground, interesting. So it's, uh, that's, that's another it depends, but that's a really interesting one. Uh, oh, here we go. 
faculty would be willing to take changes mid semester if it fixes major problems. In other words, so if they if it's a feature they want, they're happy about it. If it's yeah. not a feature they want, uh, heads will roll. Uh, let's see, features need to be tested. Faculty need lots of support and options. Uh, faculty training and regression testing need to exist. Admins and users need to opt in and out of features. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. That is what Google does. You're allowed to opt out for a period of time. So yeah, so that's that's kind of interesting. Yeah, that's also what uh, Canvas does. When they, they add a lot of new features all the time, but you have to explicitly opt into them for like maybe a year and then they force you on them. So it's a slow process. I think other LMSs and definitely like you say, G Gmail like hides a lot of stuff and you gotta enable it, so. Yeah, initially you have to enable it, later you can disable it and then after that you, you get no choice at all. Right. You know, a year is an interesting thing. I mean, if you, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious if folks could respond in the chat. So if the, if the time period before it was forced on you was was a year in which there was there was you know messaging from your institution and the first the ability to opt in and later the ability to opt out uh you know what do people think of that let's see in chuck's comment i think schools should pull from the x branch nightly there we go yeah that, chuck's a wild man mm -hmm. um yes, and is. that is time josh all right so, so <laughs> I just want to, discussion. Say, I want to say thanks to all of you guys. This was, uh, this was really great input. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, enjoy the rest of your day. There you go. All right. We're going to now turn our attention to uh, Greg McVary, who uh, probably will live in infamy as the Xbox guy uh, for <laughs> some time. Uh, sorry, Greg. <laughs> but he's going to talk about creating network networks with indie web building blocks. So yeah, take it away, Greg. I'm going to... Um... Sorry, I'm a, actually a little under the weather. I uh, okay. actually just got back from getting a COVID-19 test. Um, so I'm stuck in my, getting the Xbox out is also because I'm stuck in my office alone for till I get the results. So yeah. I gotta get all the kids crap out of here. But um, I, that being said, I didn't have time to do a slideshow. So I'm gonna do a quick uh, peach of flicker. So I need to share my screen real fast. Um, and then I just need a word from anybody. So somebody just, throw me a word in chat um, as soon as I can find it. Um, uh, privacy, accordion, accordion works, okay. It's better, nouns are better. There's not, you know, pictures, and I don't want to, this randomly searches um, Flickr and builds me 20 slides, so I didn't want to use the word privacy. All right, so, oh, do not find a word with the word accordion. There's not enough pictures of accordions in Flickr. If anybody has accordion flickers, all right, so sorry there, Joshua, I need a new word. Josh, you fail. Um, I need a new word, um, anything. Tuba, all right, let's see if there's more tuba players. All right, that's working. Do you guys see my screen or just where I typed in tuba? I think I need to unshare my screen and reshare. All right. Reshare. Yeah, we were only seeing you're selecting the. Uh, All right, well, I don't see the first slide yet, so here we go. There we go. So, when you think about a. Two, why doesn't it start yet? I'll just get going. So, when you think about a tuba, you know, you can almost say that when you can play any horn, you can play the sax, you can play any wind instrument because the, the, the notes and the fundamentals are the same. Yet, there are major differences, and I'm here to toot the horn of um, the indie web movement and how I'm using that to build OER networks in both New, um, New London and New Haven. We're building out bridges because I believe that this approach is the most resilient, sustainable, and accessible approach that we can utilize as we're building out these new tools like LTI and all this integration is a new thing. But we've had open web standards that could accomplish what we've been trying to do with LTI for a long time. And so we need to build those bridges and it's about more than just reading the music. I feel like in OER and in these LMS talks, is we spend so much time on the stuff. We're just reading the notes and scrolls by as, 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 our, as we do our each branch update. But for me, that, the focus had to be more on the stuff. I cared more about the sounds coming out of the tuba than the air going in, because that's what I think brings the smiles to the world. And so what is IndieWeb? Well, it's a movement about 10 years old. We would have had our 10th anniversary conference this year if it wasn't canceled. We're moving it online. Um, but it's about owning your own data in a space you can control 
um, to make better connections. And if you're familiar with the, you know, what's, what's really come out in like the last since few years, he's, it has been a, like a jazz band because it's very improvisational. And if you're familiar with the, the domains of one own project, um, it's a very similar idea that every, I, to me, I think portfolios are easy. You just give everybody a URL and a domain and you just encourage them to think out loud and document what they're doing. And that's how you bring the fire. Because you have to focus in more on that ethos and that than the stuff. And that's how we build monumentals. Because I think when you use HTML to me, I want, I love when, when my things are just a single document. It's not complicated. I can hit source code and I know the notes that your band is playing. No matter what your first chair, your second chair, or third chair. If you're Blackboard, Sakai, or um, Deal, whatever any of them else are. If I can hit source code and see the HTML, I know I don't need some weird new RDFA link data mess and vocabulary to, to share information. It works with HTML. But we're using this around the globe. And these are, and what I'm doing right now in Ghana is everybody who joins our, comes to our trainings, it's a 10 week training, they get their own website and we have a wiki. But these wikis and websites talk to each other using building blocks, like four friends that just hang out together. And those are indie auth, um, web mentions, uh, micropub, these are all W3C recommendations. And indie auth, that, that lets me control my identity. It says, I am jgregorymcberry.com. I am my URL. And I can sign into properties everywhere. Any like, just, it uses OAuth, just like most LTI uh, materials. But then I also have this idea of web mentions. And web mentions are great. If you remember the days of pingbacks, um, in link backs. Web mentions is kind of an update to that. It is a W3 recommendation and something that should be added to every kind of LMS. I love teaching with them. It really, it's that soothing sound of if I reply on my website and I send it to a violin player, he will then see my note as a comment on his um, post. And so it's that in intricacies that make the tuba work. All those bent pipes well, the, what makes that work is a, a little bit of microformats. And for those who don't know, microformats is an old kind of metadata. It's not old. Actually, it's still used today, probably used more by bloggers than anybody. But it really brings things into focus for me because I like having my metadata and my student data in the same place. Like, to me, that's what I mean by resilient. If an alien nation dropped in here hundreds of years ago, you know what? They don't have to go find a side file for my JSON and my XML. I have my metadata my, and my, my human readable data and my machine readable data first. So like music, I think we have to think about the audience first. And whatever comes out of your tuba, it should always be human readable first, machine readable second. And that's where I, I play with microformats. And that powers those web mentions that I'm talking about that will allow me to send out to other musicians. So I want to make an event. Hey guys, we have a band practice today because I need all three of us to get there because us tuba players really got to work together. So I just post that event and then you send me an RSVP from your website or your LMS and that will show up under my event as a reply. But the best part is I don't have to worry about all these publishing UIs to get the band back together because I have so many choices with, my, with the Micropump, which is another W3C recommendations, which is a way to read, I can use any app and as long as my website has a Micropump end, endpoint and I have, you know, I'm, I'm set up um, to, and it works with JSON too, um, the new blogging kind of um, thing that's emerging, but anybody can play the same tune because I can publish from any of those multiple apps to my website and I can show some examples afterwards. I, I sent some examples on Twitter. And then finally, when we're thinking about that fourth building block that really makes the music really hone in on that one person and that is the micro sub reader and that's what focuses the the eyes of a learner and i've taught using what a micro sub reader is like you know an rss reader was just you just got a list of articles but with a micro sub social reader i can now get a list of my student blogs and then i reply right in my reader but that reply gets published on my website or my lms and shows up on my students um artifact as a reply. So it gives me all the tools that I need to teach in a neat way that's building a lot of community because I, what's going on is I'm encouraging my students to learn and own their, like, their learning. So much of what happens in our LMS gets locked down. The students lose the tools. They lose the big picture and they can't blow their own horn as soon as the class is over. So I invent things like I've been playing with web mention badges, which is really just one permalink saying, hey, 
student A met the criteria on this link to student B, just two links talking together. Real super simple badges that can be um, upgraded to the open badge standards with a couple click of the buttons. And these are the building blocks that I want to really focus in on. But it's really those three key points that I started with. Remember that we need to encourage students to own your data. You need to control your, um, your space. Like we shouldn't be handing this over to corporate silos or to profit out, for profit LMSs. And you need to make better connections. And that's it, folks. That's my talk on um, the Indie Web and building blocks. Let me just quickly pull up a slide. Uh, to show you one more thing, um, Firefox Developer Edition, and I think I have the slide open. All right, so here is, oops, why is that making it smaller? Oh, because I use SVG. All right, so here's a slide that basically going over what we're doing in OER. Everybody, it follows the same curriculum. You tell your story, you have to learn something, you have to teach something, you have to do something. And that's how I introduce students. And I'm doing this in New Haven, Connecticut. I'm doing it in Ghana. I, I do it in kindergarten, all, all ages. But it's a curriculum of tell your story first. You have to own your story. Then learn something, teach something, do something to make the world or yourself better. And we give everybody their own website. And this is like costing us, I'm building out these, all these networks for just $200 in each uh, for two years. And you know, it's, we're giving the tools, but instead of focusing on the tools, we're trying to focus more in on the stuff of OER, I mean the ethos of OER, and then going back to the stuff. So that's my five minutes. Outstanding. <laughs> what, a, what a whirlwind. That's that's really great. Claps all around, right? Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. And and um, hope you hope your test is negative. It will be. It's just uh, it's just a sore throat. They just made me go for the because they make everybody go now. I, um, I understand. I understand. Yeah, okay. But I have an Xbox to move. That's all I know. <laughs> Thanks. We know this that too. First time at this conference, it's been a, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, I'm not at Sakai University, so you know, it's but it's still good to talk to a lot of folks. Yeah, right. Okay, so thanks, Greg. Uh, next up, we have uh, the man who, that has been said previously during this conference needs no introduction. Chuck Severance, um, a new podcast, LearnerPrivacy.org, and I am really interested to hear about this. So, Dr. Chuck, take it away. So you got to send my video. You got to start my video. Nope. You got to, you got to share a screen. You got to grab it. No, but I want to send video. I don't have a screen. You got me there. Just let me start video. Okay. So is it working? Yeah, we see you. Okay. Hi everybody. I would Greg. I love Greg's last talk. I was like Googling Micropub and stuff like that and thinking about LTI and Micropub and stuff like that. So first off, don't tweet this until next week, okay? So I'm really sorry that we can't be together because I bought some really cool swag to give to you, um, but I can't. And I, it's hard to, hard to ship stuff that's really tiny, right? And so that's the problem, Josh. I got them, they're sitting in my storage unit. So this is a learner privacy, right? And, uh, and then I got another mask. Got this mask. <laughs> yep, this is you're looking good. Mask. And uh, sky mask talking about learner privacy. And then I've got this that I would have given you too. And this is a hammer so that when uh, you're listening to a canvas presentation, you can hit your screen and not cause damage. You're like, you people are idiots. <laughs> it's about privacy. Privacy for everybody. I was going to send these, but it turns out I got like 150 of these and they packed them really tightly and compress them. And if you open it, it's gigantic. And then how do you send this to people, right? Okay. So learnerprivacy.org. I fixed it. I decided to do this for a couple of reasons. So again, don't tweet this. It's launching next week, but uh, you know, this is just friends. And so, um, I looked at the last 20 years and thought to myself that from a learner privacy perspective, perhaps we should just all use Blackboard Basic Edition and go back to 2000 and never have done what we have done. 
we Sakai are responsible for the greatest privacy disaster the planet has ever seen, and that is we build LTI. And then because of LTI, Canvas existed. And then because LTI and Canvas existed, everybody went to the cloud. And now my university, who in 2000 had every bit of student privacy data sitting on its campus on a server that it was owned by the university, literally doesn't have a shred of private learner data on a university owned server, not a shred. Everybody owns it. They consider our data a wonderful asset for their private equity owners. And I'm like, you know what? This sucks. We fixed interoperability, but we didn't fix privacy. We broke privacy. I broke privacy and I'm pissed at that. Now, interestingly, there has been an IMS privacy task force for about five years. Smart people, the average attendance of an LTI working group is 30 or 40 sometimes. The average attendance for the IMS privacy task force is three or four. And I'm like, I gotta fix that. We gotta fix this and, and get to the point where privacy becomes important. So what I've done is I've dedicated myself to being a teacher. It's what I do. Teach people about learner privacy. It doesn't mean I'm an expert. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna bumble along and make mistakes and uh, through this podcast, try to communicate to stakeholders across a wide range and, and in a sense be the, the Mr. Wizard of privacy, not the greatest scientist that ever lived, but a great science communicator. So I'm trying to be communicate learner privacy. And I wanna to get to the people in all of our organizations who think I just wanna to go to Canvas because my life is, would be easier with Canvas. It's difficult to actually take care of learner privacy it's easier to just outsource it and walk away from it and make it be some private equity owner's uh, asset. So my goal is, is to educate, to get an interest in IMS privacy and, um, and get to the point where through IMS, we all get together and we begin to address real technical problems in privacy. And the timing is really good for this because uh, GDPR, which is the European privacy regulation is starting to sort of sneak across the Atlantic. We in the United States are the dumbest at this, I think, in the whole world, but GDPR is going to come across. And GDPR is still not perfect, right? There are schools that walk right by GDPR and do stupid things from learner privacy in the UK, not so much in Germany, but in the UK. And so this is going to be sort of marketed and uh, produced and try to get people to like buy in and the format is a podcast, except it's a new kind of podcast that I think that I'm inventing. I'm thinking of this podcast as a peer reviewed new style of journal. So this is a peer reviewed podcast. I will not be the only voice on this podcast. I will have interviews, I will have guest articles. So think of this as a new form of journal where the, it's 10 minutes, you can sit and listen to it in your car. It's not difficult. There are many voices. I'm gonna curate this thing and basically make a peer-reviewed journal-based, well, peer-reviewed podcast. And I've got like 40 reviewers who are reviewing all my podcasts. So I'll close by just saying, um, you can peek at it at www.learnerprivacy.org, but don't promote it until next week because I want to get three podcasts up and, and, then, and then I'll start promoting it and then you can start retweeting. And that's all I have. Okay, so um, there's actually a, a minute or two um, <laughs> for, or for to ask Dr. Chuck any questions you want to ask him. I didn't hear that. I, I'm just offering to have people um, ask questions of you. Yeah, good. Good thing I put my earphone in because I, yeah. I heard your voice somewhere on my desk, but then I'm like, <laughs> where did that earphone go? It was oh. only me talking. I, it was yeah. nobody else. Yeah. Oh, hi, how's it going? <laughs> the podcast, uh, I'll, get it, I'll get it on Spotify. I'm using a thing called Buzzsprout, which is damn amazing. It's already on Apple and it's already on Google and I have to click a button and it'll be on Spotify. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, so Didi, you've outed yourself as one of my reviewers. Yes, Didi is one of my reviewers. My reviewers are allowed to remain anonymous. It's a <laughs> distinguished group. There you go. Josh there is a go. reviewer too. I mean, well, oops, I just... Well. <laughs> <laughs> supposed to keep a secret. Josh is too. Sorry, Josh. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Cut that part out. So, okay. All right. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, um, folks, we're, uh, we, we actually have a little bit of time. And so, Alan, I'm going to point to you and, and say, are you ready? Alan has said, I'm going to put something together right quick. So Alan's going to actually take our last little slot here. Um, he says, yes, he's ready. So I'm going to uh, ask Alan Reagan from Pepperdine to take it away. I don't know what he's going to talk about even. Neither do I. So here we go. Okay, good. You know, nothing like a good old surprise. So yeah. Um, but give me a second here. And let me share my screen. Question to the group, as everybody else asks, uh, is it visible? My screen share. You're in good shape. All right. So here, um, quick Sakai lessons uh, by me in as quickly as I can. So um, I've, I've done this before. So these are the three teaching hacks that uh, we've been experimenting with recently. Um, so basically, as a professor, uh, we often get overwhelmed. Um, you know, students ask tons of questions. Um, you know, the thing that, that gets me is, you know, do I need to buy whatever resource it is or obtain whatever resource it is? Uh, we are trying to reduce costs as much as possible and, and uh, try to get away from like $200 textbooks. Um, but at the same time, we have learning materials that sometimes we create ourselves or sometimes we uh, license from others. Um, so we like to be able to answer those questions very quickly. Um, obviously, modern day students, uh, they expect different things. Um, they basically uh, want to know where they are uh, most of the time. Uh, they want to be connected and, and feel connected, and uh, they actually want to have professors use a lot of the technology. Um, they're coming from K through 12, and they've been using technology throughout in many of their experiences, not all, but many, and then they, they come to college and sometimes they get uh, uh, frustrated. Uh, professors, of course, um, basically want to be able to make that connection with their students. Um, and so in order to kind of meet our students where they are um, and at the end of the day, hopefully get some good evals, um, we try to present uh, three teaching hacks. So hack number one is the, the simple concept of redesigning uh, your courses. So uh, this is our kind of design on the student side of things. Try to keep it as easy as possible. Uh, there are only three buttons on the left-hand side. Uh, in the past, it was two buttons, but uh, given COVID-19, it became three where we had uh, Zoom added in. Um, uh, so sleek and uh, trying to be as minimal as possible. Of course, this is the instructor view, so there are a lot more tools under the hood for the instructor, um, but the students you know, only see a handful of tools. Um, we've also redesigned how we're presenting materials, um, trying to break things into very nice, easy steps, also using the collapsible uh, section so that it's more app-like, uh, more like an experience um, and uh, not just pure information and, and kind of bubble up everything so that they can get to what they want as quickly as possible. Um, if we uh, embed things uh, such as the, the full PDF of the syllabus on the page and maybe there are certain things that are really important, um, we you know, highlight those as well. Uh, so there are multiple ways to win. Structurally, you know, we break it down you know, what we're gonna do either session by session, week by week, day by day, adding the wonderful checklist. Thank you, uh, I believe it was the University of Dayton who created that. Um, and linking to assignments, tests, whatever activities there are, um, reminding folks uh, as they go through, preparing them as much as possible. Uh, I don't have it here, but you know, I have a, a Google slide deck, kind of like flashcards that people uh, are embedded there and they can go through and like self assess before they go into a test. Um, and so design was the first teaching hack. Second teaching hack uh, is using Google or leveraging those types of materials, whether it's open office um, or excuse me, office 365, Google, et cetera. Um, in our class site, uh, we have several things such as a shared class notes for crowdsourcing student notes, um, uh, our FAQ to answer those common questions. Do I need to buy the book? How do I get the book? All of those things that you address in day one, but you'd like them not to ask those questions in say week six. Um, and then a class communication form for quickly asking uh, questions and being able to address those um, either directly or remind them of existing resources. 
So this is an example from a crowdsource notes. Um, students create their notes, add, you know, screenshots, add notes related to like, this is how it works in this platform and that pl platform. Here's the, the keyboard shortcut for Windows or Mac, et cetera. Um, here is an example. It's a very long FAQ, but it breaks it down piece by piece. Um, and here's a sample from a specific chapter, like if they're having a problem and it's a common issue with the homework, just put it in the FAQ so that uh, people can self-learn and get that process of, you know, how, how can they help themselves? Um, because in the real world, you don't always go to your boss to ask you everything. Uh, you want to be able to have a little bit of a self-starter side of things. So encouraging those kinds of skills. And our class form is very simple. You know, what are you talking about? Once they ask their type of inquiry, they may ask for additional information and it bubbles up to different things. And then we can take action. We get notified when um, uh, a new response is in and we can, uh, you know, answer those things or say whether or not they're gonna be addressed as an FAQ item or it's already in the FAQ, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, hack number three is basically in order to get uh, uh, good evals, know what, how you're doing throughout. So provide regular feedback and also solicit feedback from them. Um, so these are real uh, quotes from uh, class mid midterm evals um, um, to kind of give us as instructors uh, feedback on how we're doing and what we can make, make changes. Um, and so we ask simple things like, what do you like the class? What can be improved? Common things. Everybody kind of asks those kinds of questions. Um, but, you know, the feedback can sometimes be contradictory to one another, such as it's boring or it's exciting and you know, two different people have completely different uh, feedback. Um, but based on feedback, we can take some action uh, modifying how we're gonna approach things. And uh, you know, again, these are um, additional real world uh, ideas and so passing that along. Um, so those in summary, my three teaching hacks are one, rethink your design, two, Leverage a tool, whether it's Google, whether it's Office 365, um, use those tools in order to gauge students where they are and also get that crowdsourced learning uh, as well. Uh, and then use that midterm eval or, or multiple, it, you know, it doesn't have to be once a, you know, like, you know, at the end of each, you know, couple of weeks, um, how are we doing? What can we do? Especially in an online world um, in COVID-19, checking in regularly, seeing how how folks are creating that sense of community so important. So those are, in summary, the three teaching hacks. One bonus hack I wanted to throw in there, if, oh, my slide's not in there, but um, if you were interested, I do have a, um, a hack. So if you wanted in uh, lessons to add those fun, awesome icons and um, you were unsure how to do it, you get the code from the fun, awesome website. It says, um, um, the, the code is I, and then it has its code, um, but uh, it uh, lessons tells you, hey, this code is unsupported and it strips it out and d d doesn't display it. Instead of using the I tag, use the span tag. Use the span tag that's usually not um, stripped out by anti Sammy, and uh, you should be able to use that as a hack for older versions of Sakai if you're not on the latest and greatest. So um, that is my quick um, item, and I just want to Thank you very much. Outstanding. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> well done at, for something pulled together very quickly. Uh, very good. Any questions for Alan? I noticed that we were at a high of 60 participants during this. Uh, we're down a few, but uh, that's, that's quite, a, quite a load of people that are attending this. This is really great. So folks, um, it's, it's, we're gonna be wrapping up here in just a couple of minutes. Um, I wanna encourage you to, uh, if you'd like to do a lightning talk tomorrow, we'll have another one of these sessions tomorrow and you can see how much fun they are and, and how exciting and how much people participate. Uh, please sign up. Um, the, the link is in the chat earlier. Um, I think uh, Kathy put it in there. I'm looking back through the chat here to see where it was, but I know that there was a, I, I know I saw it at some point, here we go. Um, we'll, we'll just put it in, in here again, just in case um, you could feel inspired to do this. And maybe somebody's beat me to it. Yep, there we go. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and there is my clock going off saying that we're out of time. Our next session starts in 10 minutes at half past the hour. For those of us on the East Coast, that means a quick lunch. And for the rest of you, it means various things, but we'll see you back in, in half an hour. Thanks so much for attending.